Hi class, on Shigley uh, 10th or 11th edition example 9-4, I found certain parts of it hard to follow, so I thought I'd offer an alternative walkthrough in video form using the method that I showed you last time, those eight steps. So we're supposed to perform an adequacy assessment of the statically loaded welded cantilever carrying 500 pounds depicted in this figure here. The cantilever is made of AZ1018HR hot rolled and is welded with a 3 8 inch fillet weld as shown in the figure. So this means that, let's see, I suppose this is a top view for looking down at it. That means we're gonna have a weld on this side here and we're gonna have a weld on this side here because both on the arrow side and on the other side, it shows that there's supposed to be a 3 8 inch fillet weld. Uh, 6010 electrode was used and the design factor was three and we're checking whether this design factor was actually met. So we're going to calculate the factor of safety. Three was supposed to be what it is. It should be at least three, but we'll see if that's actually true. It says A, use the conventional method for the weld metal and use the conventional method for the attachment. We're not going to do C using the welding code. Uh, the reason is that codes are quite complicated and it takes a lot of study to apply them properly. There's a lot more in the code than we can possibly cover in this course. So I don't want you walking out and thinking that you know the code. <laughs> so the conventional method, that's good for your senior projects and depending on where you work, might be fine there. Step one, we're gonna determine the location of the centroid and the direction of the surface normal of the weld pattern. So the weld pattern looks like this so let's draw this from the end on we're looking at it from here and we're taking a look at it so the weld here here's here's the metal itself here's the the part and then the weld looks like this so the centroid of the weld is going to be in the middle here and the surface normal is going to be pointing out at us let's give ourselves a coordinate system i'm going to go ahead and make this the X direction, the Y direction, and the Z direction will be out at us. Step two, decompose the applied load into force and moment components at the centroid of the weld. So in order to do that, probably easiest if we draw a side view. Here's the centroid. We've got a force acting downwards. And our reaction forces on this side, well, we're gonna have a moment and we're gonna have a force I'll call V. So in order to decompose this into a force and moment about the centroid of the weld, we need to figure out what those reaction forces are. So the sum of the forces in the Y direction, that is V minus F is equal to zero for static equilibrium. So that means that our V is equal to the applied force of 500 pounds. And if we sum the moments in this plane, we've got a positive M and we have a minus because this is a clockwise sort of moment. The distance here is six inches. I'll call that L, L times F, and that's, that's it. So that's equal to zero for static equilibrium. So that means our reaction moment is equal to LF. That's six times 500, 3,000 inch pounds. And what directions are these in? Well, this force, uh, this is in the Y direction. Yeah, the Y, so I guess we should, probably draw our axes on this diagram too. So this is our z-axis and this is our y-axis still and in this view the x-axis is pointing actually away from us into the page because the way we rotated things. Because this view is looking at it from the end on so if we have to rotate it to the side we're going to rotate the front end of this over to the right in order to view it this way then that x-axis is going to be going into the page. And this moment here, that's going to be acting in the, it looks like about the x-axis. Step three, determine what kinds of primary and secondary shear stresses that these things cause. Well, we know that our force V is going to cause a shear stress, primary shear stress. And the bending moment, M, it depends on what the direction is. The moment here is about an axis that is perpendicular to the axis of the weld. The axis of the weld is here, it's coming out at us, because that's the surface normal of the plane that the weld lies in. But in any case, they're perpendicular. 
So this is a secondary shear stress. Tau double prime M. It's a moment shear stress. We're going to end up using the M C over I type equation for that one. We don't need that yet. Step four, draw primary and secondary shear stress fields. Make that a Y, M Y over I. So at each point, we're going to draw the direction of the stress. So our primary shear stress, as always, is going to cause at every point the same magnitude stress in the direction of the applied load. We have to add what it looks like due to the bending moment. And I'm going to try to represent these with uh, out of plane. So I'm going to draw out of plane in this direction. The bending moment, if I'm pushing down here, that's going to kind of pull outwards on the top and it's going to push inwards on the bottom. So I'm going to have large pulling forces on the top. They're going to be smaller, closer to the centroid, or to the neutral axis. There's going to be zero here. And then they're going to reverse direction, start going into the page. But because they are, um, we're going to have to add them, right? And the next step is to determine where our part is going to fail, where it's most likely to fail. And that's probably going to be at either the top or the bottom, because these are perpendicular to these. There's no place where they're going to add or subtract any better or worse because they're perpendicular. We're just going to be able to use the Pythagorean theorem. It's, the top is in tension here, the bottom is in compression, so it doesn't really matter. We're going to pick um, the place where it's maximum magnitude. Let's, let's look at here. And that's, uh, this is constant everywhere, so really it only choosing the critical point is just going to depend on the, the moment stresses. Next, we're going to determine the primary and secondary shear stress magnitudes from the forces and moments. So 6 tau prime is V over A. And the area is given in the Shigley textbook, or, well, we can just think about it, right? We've got whatever the height of this thing is. We'll call it D. And then the fillet leg size, we'll call H. So the area, there's two of them. It should be 2H times D. But we need to multiply by a factor of 0 0.707 because we're going to consider the weld to fail along the throat which we talked about last time. So this becomes 1.414 HD. And if we look at bending properties of fillet welds, make sure we're on the right table, 9-2. But we've got something that looks kind of like this, and it's 1.414 HD. I think we're also going to need this, D to the third over 6, so I'll copy that down while we're at it. Oh, and fortunately, I named the length of the welds D, just like it is here. Let's calculate this. H is our leg size. This is 3 eighths in this problem. And D is 2 inches. So the area is 1.06 inches squared. And so we've got 500 pounds over 1.06 inches. Gives us a primary shear stress of 472 PSI. Our secondary shear stress, we have an M, Y over I sort of thing. I write Y, the book puts R. You can use whatever symbol you want as long as you pick the right idea. I think it should be Y because this is actually in the Y direction in this case. So and it's the maximum Y dimension. It's a D over 2. The moment we calculated before as 3,000 pounds. Y is 2 divided by 2. And on the bottom, we have I. So IU was D to the third over 6. We need to be careful. We need to multiply uh, 0 0.707 H times IU. That's going to give us I. 0.353 inches cubed. Where this factor of 0 0.707 comes from the same reason here is because we're looking at the throat thickness, not the leg size. OK, so we get 0 0.353. Just as it shows in the book, we get 8.5. KSI, or 8,500 PSI. Step seven, we're going to add the primary and secondary shear stresses as if they were vectors and calculate the magnitude. Well, these are perpendicular. These ones are facing down. These ones are going out of the page. So we just use the Pythagorean theorem. So tau, the total magnitude, is equal to the square root. We've got tau prime. That's going to be squared. 
plus tau double prime, that squared too. And that gives us, say, 8510 PSI. Finally, step eight, we're going to figure out the safety factor. Now, what I showed you to do before is if we wanted to see whether it was safe or not, then we are going to compare tau to 0 0.3 times the ultimate tensile strength. To get the safety factor, the book is not using this sort of relationship. This relationship here is actually coming from experiments, probably, and it's in the codes from AWS, the American Welding Society, and AISC, American Institute of Steel Construction. For example, you can see it says here in the American Welding Society's section on design for welds, welds, design of welded connections, the allowable connection stress on a fillet weld is the shear on the effective area, where it's defined the effective area to be uh, through the throat, 0 0.3 times the nominal tensile strength of the filler metal. And so it doesn't tell you explicitly, but there is already a design fa or a factor of safety that's built into this, but it doesn't tell you what it is. So we're not going to use this. Shigley has started with kind of the relationship that sigma prime, sigma prime is the von Mises stress, is equal to the yield strength at yield. And so we say, well, how our factor of safety is defined as how many times could we increase the von Mises stress and not yield? Or equivalently, n is equal to Sy over our von Mises stress. Now we're pretending that this is a shear stress, right? And so what is the von Mises stress uh, when we've got pure shear? One way of looking at it is we've got a situation of plane stress because there's a got shear in one direction, and in that, in that coordinate system, we've got zero stresses on opposing faces, actually in all of our faces. But our formula for von Mises stress in plane stress, which we have, is sigma x squared minus sigma x sigma y plus sigma y squared plus 3 tau xy squared. Everything else is zero. All of this stuff is zero. We've just got this 3 tau xy squared. So this becomes root 3 times tau xy, or tau in our case. So let's plug that in and see what happens. So this is sy over, let's borrow this, and let's figure out 1 over root 3. 1 over root 3 is approximately 0 0.577 times sy divided by tau. And so the sy, this is for the weld material, the filler. We've got a 6010 electrode, 50 PSI or KSI is the yield strength. So we've got 0 0.577 times 50, and we're going to divide by 8.51. And we get 3.39, which was greater than the required design factor of 3, so we're OK here. OK, the next part says we need to analyze using the conventional method for the attachment the cantilever metal. Now it's kind of vague here. What does it mean by the attachment? Does it mean the attachment between the weld and uh, this gray plate here? Does it mean the attachment between the weld and the part here? It could have meant either one of those things, but actually it only shows in the book the stress on this part itself, like the bending moment in the part, the pink part itself. That's the calculation it's doing in the book. If I had asked you to analyze a cantilevered beam that looked like the part that we have here, and I asked you to find out what the maximum stress was and the factor of safety, this is exactly what you would have done. You'd say, well, we have this force F. This is 500 pounds. It's creating a bending moment, internal bending moment about here. Our bending moment is 3,000 inch pounds force. You would have looked up the formula for uh, the moment of inertia. Well, you would have said the normal stress due to the bending moment at the top here. This is where the bending moment's normal stress is maximum. That's probably where it's going to fail. So you're going to say sigma is equal to my over i. You say i in this case is bh to the third over 12. b, that's the thickness. We've got a 3 8 inch thick part. h is a height of 2 inches and 12. So let's go through this. This is 0 0.25. And so our my over i, we've got m is 3,000 
that gets multiplied by y, which is 2 inches divided by 2, so just 1. And we divide by 0 0.25. And we get 12 ksi. And we said, well, what's the factor of safety on that? Well, it's just n times our von Mises stress is equal to sy. Well, what's our von Mises stress in this case? We're in plane stress. So our von Mises stress is given by this formula here. But look, sigma y is equal to 0. We've only got a sigma in one direction. And we've got no shear stress in that coordinate system. So this really just simplifies to our sigma from the bending moment squared. Well, and we can take that square root. It's just whatever our sigma from the bending moment was, which makes sense. It's like in pure tension, something's going to yield at the tensile yield strength. So n is equal to sy over sigma from up here. Now, what is the yield strength that we're going to use? We need to be careful. The yield strength is for that material. It's AZ1018. Here's 1018, hot rolled. The yield strength is 32 ksi. Because we're just analyzing the pink part right now. That's all the book ended up doing. So we have 32 divided by 12 gets 2.67, which is not greater than 3, so we fail. So it wasn't satisfactory. So this is the calculation that the book was doing, but I can understand why this would be confusing because we've also talked about attachment between the weld and either of the two pieces of base metal. So I think it's worth talking about. We don't have to go through the calculation, but talking about how we would also analyze those and maybe why the book chose not to. Well, one thing I think is that the book while it does analyze in some simple situations what the attachment strength is between the weld and the base metal, it only does it for very simple shear and pure shear and pure tension cases, and it doesn't ever do it. No, it shows no examples for when you have a bending moment of some sort that's causing stress distributions and, and all that sort of thing. So it doesn't really outline a method for doing that. So one way that you can do it, the most conservative method I've seen, is you just say, all right, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be very conservative here. I know that the attachment between the weld and the base metal, if you look at a fillet weld, right, I'll look at a fillet weld from the side. Here are the attachments that we're talking about analyzing. We're talking about analyzing either here or we're talking about analyzing here. Well, I know that those areas are going to be bigger than this area here, the throat. And I've done my calculation for the weld material on the throat. So we've calculated our shear stresses very conservatively that we might see, or the stresses that we might see very conservatively. We can just use the stress that we calculated up here and figure that that stress is greater than or equal to whatever we'd have on the attachments. Then you say, what should I compare that to if I want to analyze the attachment to the base metal? Well, you would want to say tau. You want to compare that, just as like we did before up here. We said it was 0.57 sy over tau. We're going to use, we're going to get the factor of safety by saying n is 0 0.577 times tau, or times sy over tau. We analyzed the weld before. What's the, the thing that we should do? We should, instead of using sy for the weld, use for the sy for the base metal. And so we could check the attachment that way. So in our case, we get 0 0.577 times 32 divided by, we had 8.5 shear stress. We'd actually only have 2.17 as our factor of safety. So it's definitely not satisfied if we're going that conservative. This is a very conservative way of analyzing the attachment strength between the weld material and the base metal. In a sense, it's analyzing the weld as though some of the base metal or had seeped into when it was liquid into the welded area, and that's where it was failing. So if you want to be very conservative, this is one way that you could do things. And then you wouldn't have to look at the two attachments separately. Basically just say, I'm going to check out my safety factor using the weakest of the yield strengths between the base metal and the weld material.